I want to go back and uh, look at a few of those verses, but before I do, Olivia is ready for uh, Acorn Corner, so if you are three to eight years old, you're welcome to go, and uh, she'd love to spend the rest of the morning with you uh, back at Acorn Corner. Uh, Psalm 45, if you would look at that, I want, to, I want to draw attention to a couple of things that were read already this morning. As we look today at the Prince of Peace, everybody say the Prince of Peace. Everybody say the Prince of Peace. Peace. Are you awake today? The Prince of Peace. It's always a good time to be reminded about peace because God wants us to live with lots and lots of peace in our life. In Psalm 45 verses 1 to 7 were read this morning. I want to look at verse 6 specifically. It says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Your throne, O God, is how long? Forever and ever. And ever. I want you to know today that the Prince of Peace reigns forever and ever. That peace has come and peace is available right now and will continue to be available. In Isaiah chapter 11, uh, we, we did not hear this this morning, but I want to draw your attention to this as well. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. It says, Then a shoot will spring up from the stem of Jesse, And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make decisions by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. I want you to know this morning that the Prince of Peace has your back. <laughs> that you don't have to fight for everything. The Prince of Peace, it says here, he's the one who's going to judge. He's the one who's going to make decisions. He's the one who's going to be establishing righteousness and fairness. And he will slay the wicked. Now, Isaiah chapter 9. I want to finish with that this morning. We did hear this read just a few moments ago. Isaiah chapter 9, and I want to look at verses 6 and 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And on his name, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace is who came at Christmas time. The Prince of Peace is what God wants us to know about this morning peace. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, Peace is good. But how many of you know that peace doesn't come and all of a sudden, I I use this term from time to time, zappo, and we just live with peace? How many of you had a little bit of of stirring up with the peace in your life? You've had had things that have happened that have kept you from walking in peace, things that are stirred up in your life. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to come back to a place of peace. Today you can remember peace, today you can embrace peace, and today you can pray and continue to experience peace in your life. So this morning I'd like to do a couple of things as we talk about the Prince of Peace. I want to talk about Prince, what does the word Prince mean, and peace. It is uh, quite common for Christians or even people who live in a Christian nation to hear phrases and not to think much about them. So when we say the Prince of Peace, do we ever really step back and say, what all is in there? What does that mean? What does it look like? I had a teacher not too long ago who said that especially when we talk about spiritual realities, things from the Bible, principles, it's important for us to ask the question, what does that look like? So if I were to say to you, are you living in peace? And you were to say yes or no, either way, the important question would be, well, what does that look like? What does it look like to embrace the Prince of Peace? What does it look like to know the Prince of Peace? What is the Prince of Peace? What does that even mean? And so this morning, I want to encourage you with these words, Prince and Peace. I want to look at the, the detailed meanings of them and then encourage you as we wrap up later on this morning with the idea of walking in peace no matter what you're experiencing. Because I believe today that most of us, if not all of us in here, have some storms in our life right now. How many of you, if I were to say today, you have a storm going on in your life. You have stuff going on around you that would like to uproot your peace. How many of you would raise your hand and say, I've got some storms going on right now. So most of us, maybe all of us, actually have some storms going on. The Prince of Peace is here to bring peace in the middle of your storm. And we're going to wrap up with that story. So let's remember the Prince this morning. 
The Prince of Peace. What is the Prince and what are all of the detailed meanings that we can look at this morning? So first of all, Jesus as the Prince of Peace, he is the head. He is the head person. He is the head of all of peace. The prince is in charge. The prince is over and not under. The prince as the head is before and not after. The prince as the head is above and not below. Earlier I was talking about the head of the fish. The head of the fish comes before the tail of the fish, right? Fish don't swim backwards. Maybe they do, but, but generally the head of the person is on top, right? All right, now see, this is where I realize you're not really listening. Generally, the head of the person is on top, right? If it's not, it's a problem. The head is at the top. The head is the, is the one who is over everything. Jesus is the head of pre peace. He is the first of peace. He is the beginning of peace. He is the over of peace. Secondly, the word means captain or chief. Captain or chief. The word is about, he is the chief of peace. Peace. What does that mean? First of all, a chief or a captain is the leader. Right? A chief or a captain is the one who is out front. A chief or a captain is the one who is in front of peace or the leader of peace. A chief or a captain makes decisions for those that are following him. And so Jesus is making decisions about peace in your life. A, a, a chief is the one at the center of the plan for peace. I want you to know today that in your life, if you're experiencing a storm, Jesus has already made a plan for peace in your life. He's already established. He's already strategized, if you will. The captain and the chief is strategizing for the whole group. And so Jesus has already created a strategy for you to live in peace in your life. Thirdly, the word prince, when we talk about the prince of peace, the word prince means general or governor. General or governor. The general or the governor is in charge of peace. Are you following? Are you getting a theme here? He leads the way for peace. He makes a plan for peace. He's respected by his followers and is obeyed by those under him. In other words, Jesus is again, as we mentioned already, is all over peace. He is the leader. He is the general. He is the one who makes the decisions about peace. Thir fourthly, the prince of peace is the keeper. So Jesus is not just the establisher of peace, but he is the keeper of peace. In other words, if you once found peace in your life, and many times this happens for the first time when we come to Jesus and we accept him as, as Savior, we get peace in our lives. How many of you remember that moment when you first accepted Christ and suddenly you had peace about so many things in your life? So Jesus is the maker of peace. He is the prince of peace as the maker, but he is also the keeper of peace. Today... If you're experiencing difficulties and you're not experiencing peace in your life, you can turn back to the keeper of peace at any moment and he will enable you to keep that peace, to come back to that peace that you first had in your life. He is the keeper of peace. He holds peace in his hands. He offers peace to you today. Finally, the word prince refers to the Lord and the master of peace. These all have a same ring to them, don't they? He's the Lord and the master of peace. He's the ruler of peace. Peace responds to him. Peace is under him. And peace comes because he says it will. Jesus is the prince of peace. I want you to, to grab hold of those realities today. So at the center of peace for your life and my life is Jesus. And yet Jesus as the commander, as the captain, as the general, as the governor, as the keeper, as the master, as the head, as the Lord. He's all of those things. And yet, Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish theologian of another century, tells a story of a prince who wanted to find a maiden suitable to be his queen. One day, while running an errand in the local village for his father, he passed through a poor section. As he glanced out the windows of the carriage, his eyes fell upon a beautiful peasant maiden. During the ensuing days, he often passed by the young lady and soon fell in love. But he had a problem. How would he seek her hand? He could order her to marry him, but even a prince wants his bride to marry him freely and voluntarily and not through coercion. He could put on his most splendid uniform and drive up to her front door in a carriage drawn by six horses, but if he did that... He would never be certain that she married him for himself. She would, he would never know whether she was simply overwhelmed with all of the splendor. 
So he came up with a solution. He would give up his kingly robe. He moved into a village, into the village, entering not with a crown, but in the garb of a peasant. He lived among the people, shared their interests and concerns, and talked their language. In time, the maiden grew to love him for who he was and because he had first loved her. The Prince of Peace is the same. The Prince of Peace who wants to bring you peace doesn't say you have to have peace. Doesn't command that you come to peace. He came to be one of us. He came and lived among us so that he could offer us what it looks like to live in peace. So when I asked earlier, what does it look like to live in peace? Jesus is the picture of living in peace. You want to study peace in a life? Study the picture of Jesus. And study his own experiences. And study the fact that he came and he experienced everything that you and I have experienced. I want you to know today that if you have a storm in your life, in some way Jesus experienced the same fears, the same situations, the same concerns that you have in your life. And yet he lived in complete assurance that his Father in heaven was taking care of him. What does it look like? The Prince of Peace, Jesus himself, is our picture. Here's another uh, I guess a, a little writing about Jesus as the Prince of Peace. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never set foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He never wrote a book or held office. He did none of these things that usually accompany greatness. While he was still a young man, a tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends deserted him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for the one piece of property he had, his cloak. And when he was dead, he was taken down, laid in a borrowed grave. Twenty centuries have come and gone. And today, this is the central figure, figure for much of the human race. All the armies that ever marched and all the navies that ever sailed and all the parliaments that ever sat and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, could have done all kinds of things, but he chose to come in an extremely humble way. And because he did that, he experienced all of these things we just read about he lived his life as a, as, a, as a poor person in a village, was raised up and lived among people, uh, shared stories and walked with people, became popular. And in all of it, when things turned around and when things turned against him, actually as soon as he started his ministry, he had lots of people who were against him. You realize that? The day he announced his ministry, he was, they, were, they tried to throw him off the cliff. How many of you remember that? So Jesus experienced, I want you to know, the picture of the Prince of Peace, the picture of peace is Jesus. And in his life, you can look and find something that's similar to what you're experiencing and move toward that to live in peace, which let's talk about peace for just a little bit. What does peace look like? What is peace defined as? What does the Bible define peace as? And you might take some interest in this today. First of all, the Bible, this word peace that you see throughout the Bible, the Prince of Peace, has as a part of its root prosperity. Everybody say prosperity. prosperity. Now, if, with that in mind, I could preach a prosperity gospel today. That got some silent wonders about of those who are sitting here. Why? Because... When you hear prosperity, you think of prosperity the way that we normally think of it, which is rich people. And you think that prosperity is about getting lots of things for yourself because you've been told over and over prosperity isn't a good thing. Maybe by the culture, maybe by the world, maybe by people even in the church. But peace has as one of its root meanings prosperity. And in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper. Everybody say prosper. And be in good health just as your soul prospers. In other words, Jesus wasn't just concerned. God wasn't just concerned about giving us salvation for our soul. He was also concerned about making us prosperous in this life. But I would suggest to you that prosperous does not necessarily mean gathering lots of things for our lives. It can. People can be prosperous that way, but you can be prosperous in other words, in other ways. For example, prospering that the, peace, that the Prince of Peace brings is a prospering that is simply living a life of success or accomplishing what we have set out to do. Now, 
especially when you, when you set out to do things that God has called you to do. So God wants you to prosper at whatever he's called you to do. Just last week we had a membership uh, class and we were talking about what it means to be engaged. Jim was talking about that this morning as he shared with you, live, connect, engage. And we were talking about what it means to be engaged. And I believe that being engaged is more than just serving as an usher in the church. You should do that. It's more than just serving at the sound desk. It's more than serving in those kinds of ways. Being engaged is finding your God-given calling. And then as the Prince of Peace moves in your life, prospering in what God has called you to do. I believe that some people here today, young and old alike, are called to prosper in the business world. I believe that God calls some of you to prosper in, in the education realm. I believe God called some of you to prosper in, in the medical field. God has called us to prosper in the field he's called us to. And in that, as you, as you, as you glorify God in your prosperity, you, ex, you, you are an example of what peace looks like. You are an example of what it looks like to walk in peace. Look at your neighbor and say, prosperity is a part of, pre, a part of peace. Don't say priest. Prosperity is a part of peace. That's important for us to embrace today. When we think of peace, the first thing we think of generally is lack of conflict. So when you hear peace, most of the time, that's the first thing we think about. And that is a part of peace, but it's not what peace is about. Not the Prince of Peace when he brings peace. That's a different kind of peace that God is talking about. Prosperity is more than financial wealth. It's the ability to move forward and take the next step, see the next step. I want you to know today that if you're stuck in your path, if you're stuck in what the next step is, if you're not sure what's next... Peace is the process of discovering the next step. And God is able to show you what the next step is. He doesn't intend for you to stay confused about your life, about the plans for your life. He doesn't intend for you to be wandering around not knowing what you should do. He intends for you to live in peace, which is prosperity, which is success, which is knowing the plan for your life. That is a part of peace. The second thing that is a part of peace is success. Everybody say success. I believe that God has another level of success for you in your life. Another level of success. And when I say success, I'm not limiting it to your business endeavors or to your worldly endeavors. I'm talking about everything that you try to move towards. So, for example, in your life, when you're reading the Word or you're reading the Bible and you're understanding that God calls us to live a holy life, I believe that God wants you to live with success and holiness. Now, if you're like me, and if you're like most people that are honest as Christians, you struggle with living a holy life. Holiness is difficult sometimes. Somebody say amen. amen. So I know I'm not just by myself. How many of you struggle with living a holy life? Most of us do, but peace is about living a holy life and being successful in that as well. So it's not just out there, it's success in here. God wants you to succeed in life. And many, there are many different places and ways to succeed, but God doesn't want you living frustrated with your decisions, with your past, or with your present. He wants to give you a sense that you have accomplished his plan and his goals for your life. Success. Everybody say success. So peace is prosperity, peace is success, and peace is welfare or your state of health. Your welfare, your, the way that you're cared for, or your state of health. I have been amazed in the past couple of weeks as I spent a little bit of time with Lynette a couple of weeks ago and I spent a little bit of time with Twyla Sealand who went through just a, a, a time of testing whether she had cancer or not. And both of them, both of them declared to me in their situation, in their circumstance, I'm at peace. Did you know that it doesn't depend on your health whether you have peace or not? Your health doesn't determine your peace your attitude towards your health determines your peace. Now, I believe this. God wants you to be healthy and healed and whole in your life. I believe that's a part of the promise of the Prince of Peace. I believe the ruler of peace wants to give you health in your life. However, if you come to a place in your life where you aren't experiencing health, and how many of you have been there in your life? You are not experiencing complete health. You can still live with peace because God has put the peace within you to deal with whatever it is that you're dealing with. Your general state of health, your wholeness, is what Jesus wants to bring to you. But in your lack of wholeness, God will also bring you peace. He's the leader and he is the ruler of all peace. The final thing that is a part of peace is deliverance and salvation. Deliverance and salvation. Deliverance. 
Why would Jesus be the prince of deliverance, the ruler of deliverance, the, the, the governor, the chief, the captain of deliverance? Well, the answer is because all of us need deliverance in our life. Everybody needs deliverance. Now, some of you, again, it's interesting what pictures these words conjure up, right? Some of you, when you hear the word deliverance, you start to hear, remember about movies where you saw exorcism and, and it was scary and it was just weird. Somebody say amen to that. It's just weird. And, and, and so it's kind of like, no, that's, uh, why would I need deliverance? Well, I'll tell you why you need deliverance. Because in our lives and in the world we live in, there are forces that are against God. The Bible tells us that there are demons at work all around us. And the truth is, as pre-Christians, before we accept Christ, the demons have entrance into our lives. And whether we like to see it or not, that doesn't mean we froth at the mouth. And that doesn't mean that we, you know, as the Bible tells us about the man that was lived in the tombs, that we run around naked. I don't know many of you that have done that. Actually, I don't, I don't know any of you that have done that. But, but it doesn't, that, when we think about demons in us, you, you start to go to the extreme. And that can be a way that that can lead to but in us, there are demonic forces, pre-Christian, that try to get us to do things that are not godly. And try to get us to believe things that are not godly. And as a Christian, it's important for all of us to come to the place of saying, I want everything that is in me that is not of God to be delivered of it, to be delivered from it. And peace is that place where we begin to experience the deliverance. Everybody say deliverance. The deliverance from the things that we carried with us into the Christian life. All of us carried things with us. Some of it is our own junk and some of it is the stuff that Satan placed in our lives and that we gave access to by our own actions. I was talking with somebody the other day and we were talking about our personal experience. In my life, I'll tell you just a story. In my life, um, uh, when Linda and I got married, I've mentioned this several times, but uh, when Linda and I got married, I was experiencing... In the middle of the night, I was experiencing terrible nightmares. And they were the nightmares that, that, that I would wake up. The nightmare would get worse and worse and worse. And I would wake up and be completely paralyzed with fear. But I would be awake. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. I was paralyzed physically and awake with fear. That's pretty bad. And I was talking to someone about that recently. And they were saying they had the same experiences. And we were, we were talking about where did, where did that come from? I want you to know today that if you're experiencing that, there's deliverance from it. You don't have to live with that kind of thing. But even as a Christian, I had been a Christian when I met Linda. I had been a Christian for probably about 20 years, a little less than 20 years. And I was still experiencing this reality in my life. So I went to uh, someone who knows about these things named Roy Kreider. And we spent a few times talking. And one of the things that he helped me to do is look back at the things I had experienced in my life. The person I was talking with the other day described how in elementary school they would go into the bathroom and, and do, do Ouija board and was discovering that because she had experienced that Ouija board experience, she carried that in and she, and she was saying that she had had the same nightmare experiences that I had and that was her deliverance when she began to speak. As a matter of fact, this is interesting. She said that when she began to pray one of the prayers out of the Neil Anderson material, the Freedom in Christ material, that the prayer of renouncing that specific thing, she couldn't get the words out. Every time she got to the middle of it, her words would reverse. How many of you know that's demonic? And, and so she had something in her life that she had to be delivered from. And when she finally was able to pray that prayer, she was delivered and she stopped experiencing those nightmares. For myself, when Linda and I began to pray, um, actually this, was, uh, this would happen at night. And after two times, I think, of Linda waking up and seeing that me laying there with my eyes open and paralyzed, she said, we're not having this in our bed. <laughs> so that's why we went to find help. We began to pray, and for us, it was a journey of praying every night, every night, every night, every night for about four or five years. Maybe it wasn't quite that long, maybe two or three years, but we prayed every night, and slowly, but slowly, but slowly, they began to diminish until I don't experience those things anymore, but I needed deliverance. Are you with me? So it's important to know that the Prince of Peace brings deliverance for your life. 
If you experience fears, if you experience anxious moments, if you experience all kinds of things and you feel like they shouldn't, they don't line up with Christianity, with what God said he gave to you, perhaps one of the things that you need is to go to the Prince of Peace and receive deliverance. And the final thing is salvation. And so that's generally the first thing we think of. But I wanted to talk about these other things because peace envelops all of those things. Prosperity, success, welfare, deliverance, and salvation. Obviously, the Prince of Peace came to give us peace with God so that we can live with God and know God and walk with God as our Father and as our Lord. Several years ago, a submarine was being tested and had to remain submerged for many hours to test it. When it returned to the harbor, the captain was asked, how did the terrible storm last night affect you? And the officer looked at him with surprise and said, storm? We didn't even know there was one. The sub had been so far beneath the surface that it had reached the area known to sailors as the cushion of the sea. Although the ocean may be whipped into huge waves by high winds, the waters below are never stirred. And that's a perfect picture of peace in the storm, peace in the center of what is happening, the Prince of Peace and the way he wants to bring us peace. So this morning, I want to wrap up our time together by talking about what does it look like to live with peace in the storm. I believe that God wants to remind us, God wants to take us to that place where we can remember how we can live even in the difficult time, even in the storm. I want you to turn your Bibles to, to Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to just look briefly at this story of Jesus and peace in the storm. Peace in the middle of the storm. Matthew chapter 8 verse 23. And I just want to read a couple of verses and then I want you to, to just see a couple of points out of this. In Matthew 8 verse 23 it says, When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with the waves, but Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? And he got up, rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. That's a real simple story. A lot of us know that story. You've heard that story before. I've also mentioned this to, to some of you that... When I was in Israel a couple of years ago, we were having dinner right on the Sea of Galilee, this same sea. We were, we were sitting out on a, on a pier that was out over the Sea of Galilee. And as we were sitting there, we were finishing up our dinner. The wind started to blow, and in, in, in no time, there was a huge storm blowing so hard that it was blowing the glasses over on the table. And it was just knocking stuff down on the table. And we, I have a little video of us sitting there trying to, trying to sit out in the storm and hold our dessert plates down. And the wind is blowing everybody's hair. And they're saying, hey, how's it going over there? It's fine. This is a great evening for a dessert. So finally we moved inside. And it was an amazing picture of this story for me. That a storm can come up that quickly. A storm that is so powerful could come up that quickly. And the, the uh, owners of the restaurant told us that those, that hasn't happened for about three years. So I think God wanted me to have that experience so I could share it with you. Because in your life and in my life, sometimes storms come out of nowhere. You ever been blindsided by a storm? Things are going pretty smoothly. You feel like you have peace. Things are happening really good. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it could be in your marriage. It could be in your business. It could be with your kids. It could be wherever. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, you feel like you're just in the middle of chaos. Anybody? So this is the storm that comes up. And I want you to see, out of this story, I want you to see just three things that we can uh, take with us. Number one. Number one, peace is not a lack of storms. Peace is not a lack of storms. If you're looking in your life to always have a lack of storms, you're going to miss the peace that Jesus wants to give you. In this story, I think it's very interesting that, that it starts by saying, and uh, Jesus, and when he got into the boat, the disciples followed him. It's important to me that you see this. The disciples were following Jesus. Uh, how many of you would agree that's a good place to be? Matter of fact, not only were they following him, they were with him. They were, his presence was with them. Wouldn't you believe that that would be the safest place on earth? And actually it was, but it didn't feel like it. In your life and my life as followers of Jesus, you are going to experience storms. Because sometimes Jesus, like he did in this place, he's going to lead you into the storm. You see, 
If we're not careful, we take storms as a evidence that Jesus is not with us. If we're not careful, we, we're, we're walking along and the storm comes up and we say, oh, this must be the wrong way to go. And we turn around and go the other way, but that's not necessarily the truth. Were the disciples wrong to be with Jesus? Absolutely not. They were exactly where he wanted them to be. Why did Jesus want them in the boat with him when a storm came up? Because he wanted to reveal to them that even in the storm, even in the difficult place, he's still Lord. He still has authority. He still takes care of you. He's still there even in the storm. That's really powerful. You want to, you got to write that down. He's still there even in the storm. Your situation, if it's difficult right now, Jesus is still there. It doesn't mean that you've walked away from Jesus if you're experiencing a storm. It doesn't necessarily. Now, it can be that we do walk away from Jesus, but this picture shows us that even when walking with Jesus, storms will come up. Peace is not a lack of storms. Peace is knowing that when Jesus is in the storm with you, he is able to take care of you in the storm. That's why when Twyla and Lynette, who, are, who were wrestling with cancer, Lynette, if, for some of you that don't know, Lynette Krull is a person in our congregation that is dealing with cancer in her life right now. That's why they're able to say, in the middle of that storm, I have peace. Because even though this evidence outwardly doesn't look like peace, Jesus is able to give us peace in the middle of a storm. One of the reasons that many of us lose our peace in the storm is we didn't expect it in the first place. You have to make ready. If you're a young person here today and you haven't experienced a storm in your life, this is your warning. Get ready because you will have a storm in your life. Ask anybody who is sitting around you, will you experience a storm? Absolutely. Some of you will experience harder storms than others because God wants to show himself in deeper ways to you than he wants to show himself to others at that point. But every Christian will experience storms in this life. And one of the reasons we don't experience peace in the storm is we just didn't expect it. If you ever hear a preacher or if you ever hear a ministry or you ever hear somebody who preaches the message that it's always good when you're a Christian, run as fast as you can because it's not true. Amen. It's just not true. Your heart and your soul can be always good when you're a Christian, but your external circumstances will not always be good when you're a Christian. The Bible makes that clear. First thing is we need to expect the storm. One of the things that one of the reasons we lose our peace in the storm is we've been sold an idea that peace is the lack of storms. Peace is anything but the lack of storms. With Jesus, you will experience trials, pain, fear, and storms. But if we could remember that, we should expect the storm. We should be ready for the storm. We wouldn't be prone to panic. <laughs> How many of you understand and recognize that word and you feel it in your own life? We are prone to panic when the storms rise up. This is what the disciples, as a matter of fact, when they came to him, they said, they said, we're dying here. What in the world? Wake up. At least they knew where to go for help, right? At least they knew, hey, there's this guy named Jesus. He's in the boat with us. Let's ask him. Oh, he's asleep. And, and, I, and, and, and it says with an exclamation point, we're perishing here. Help. Sometimes you get in the middle of the storm, it's okay to pray that prayer. Help! You ever pray that prayer? It's a really deep theological prayer. It's, it's it, Jesus, help! You ever just pray this prayer? Jesus, 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 Jesus! Y'all remember where I prayed that prayer? I've told this story over and over, but I like to tell the story. When I was driving my Ford Explorer on roads like we had, well, yesterday the roads weren't that bad, but there was just like this much snow on the road. And I came around the corner and it, and it slid off the road and it went up on two wheels. And I prayed that deeply theological prayer. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And then I sat back down and stopped right in front of a big tree and looked around and said, oh, I'm okay. <laughs> that can happen in the storm. But here's the second thing I want you to know. Not everyone experiences the peace. Not everyone experiences the peace. You ever experience this in your marriage? Something comes against your family and one of you is at peace and one of you is not. I hear the chuckles. I know you get it. You're in your business, you know, and, and your, your, your co-workers and something's happening. The you get word. I saw yesterday that Rosetta Stone is closing their distribution plant, which is, I don't know, close by here somewhere. 
and, and, and some, you get word about that, and you got, you know, you work at the distribution plant, I don't know, whatever it's called, and, and some people don't have peace, and some people do. You ever consider your, your options in those situations? So let's say it's a financial storm, and all of a sudden, you know, you got way less income than you had before. You ever experienced that in your family? And again, one of you says, you know what? I trust that God is going to take care of us. And the other one says, but how's he going to do it? How's that going to, what's it going to look like? Look at this amount we've got. And what we, you ever experienced that? In the storm, some people can experience peace while other ones are not experiencing peace. Jesus was at peace. Now, let's be honest. He was Jesus. So he, he was like, he had this amazing connection to God and he understood, my father loves me and he's going to take care of me. He also understood something else and this is important. Jesus understood, let's remember this also, Jesus operated when he was on this earth as a natural human being, anointed by the Holy Spirit. That's important because you are the same as Jesus in that aspect. As a believer in Jesus, you are a natural human being filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus understood, why could Jesus sleep in the boat? He understood that at any time he could get up and tell the waves and the wind, stop it. Amen. That's amazing. Come on. He, he knew that he didn't have to worry because if things got really bad, even if the boat started to sink, he could say, come back up. Right? Because remember Peter? Peter sunk in the water and Jesus just... It's okay, I got you. Are you with me? Jesus understood the authority he had, and I believe that's why he said this to the disciples. He said to the disciples, the Prince of Peace looks at the disciples when they come to him and they say we're perishing, and he said to them, why are you afraid? He could have stopped there. But he didn't. He said, you men of little faith. What was keeping them from walking in peace? Their lack of faith. They did not believe that God was with them. They didn't also believe that they had authority. Remember Jesus, he kept saying things like, man, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to a mountain, be removed, and it'll be moved. He kept telling them, you have authority. You have authority with just a little bit of faith. And it, that's why when they came to him in fear in the storm, when they weren't having peace in the storm, his comment to them was, why are you afraid? Sometimes we need to look at ourselves, look at our soul and say, why are you afraid? What? Why are you afraid? Oh, soul of little faith. Maybe just for a little bit today, would you just say that to yourself? Why are you afraid? Go ahead, just say it out loud. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? I want you to think about what you're afraid of today. What are you afraid of? Losing something? Are you afraid of, of what's going to happen in your family? Are you afraid of this? Why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. That should stir you up and it should stir me up. In these seven weeks of prayer, you should, I want you to remember this. Jesus, I believe, was saying to the disciples, you could have done that. You could have said to the wind and the wind. How many of you believe that any believer can command the, the, the weather to do what they want and if they have enough faith, it'll happen? I believe that. That's, Jesus said, Jesus said, why are you afraid? Look at your neighbor and say, why are you afraid? No, no, I said, that's how you did it. Why are you afraid? No, I mean, get serious about it. Look at you and say, why are you afraid? That's better. They turn to the right source, the Prince of Peace, and he looks at them and says, why are you afraid, oh, you men of little faith? The final thing I want us to see is Jesus is our ultimate peace in all things. Jesus is your ultimate peace in all things. No matter what you're experiencing, you can go to Jesus and find the peace that you need. I was talking with somebody the other day about my, my own self and the, and the path that is ahead for Linda and I and just the situation. You know, so do you ever consider, you know, what's next or where you're going? I, I'm not I, I have to be careful when I say things like that because people think I'm leaving. That's not my plan. It was more a, a saying, you know, what is next? I think there's always a next. And in the process of talking about it, I, I came back and I said, but you know, no matter what happens next, I, at the core of who I am, I have a faith to believe that God will take care of us no matter what happens. Now, I don't live that out every day. 
Can somebody say amen to that? I, you know, some days I'm not, sh I, I don't live with, with, that, with that reality, but most days you and I ought to live with the reality that no matter what happens, God is going to take care of me. God is with me. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is the ruler of my heart. Therefore, I can live in peace in any circumstance. Jesus is the ultimate peace in all things. He's not just peace in the storms. He's peace in health, peace in success, peace in prosperity, peace in welfare, and peace in deliverance. He brings peace into every area of our lives. And we can weather, you can weather any storm, every storm, any storm that comes by. You can weather any storm with peace in the storm. If we'll trust and submit to the Prince of Peace, that baby in a manger that we heard sung about this morning that, that came, that, that child, the gift, we're focused on the gift. We're focused on the greatest gift. He comes as a prince ready to rule and reign in all things, even in your hardest time in your life. So I want to encourage you to take a couple things with you this morning. I want to encourage you, first of all, as you go from this place to evaluate your peace quotient. How much peace do you live with? Are you high on the scale of living with peace or low on the scale of living with peace? And let's be honest. If you're high on the scale, you tend to stay high on the scale. If you're low on the scale, you tend to be a little bit more of a worrier, right? You tend to be more of a, or as some people would say, you're just more practical in the way you think about things. How many of you in your marriage, you have one that thinks sort of down to earth and you have one that always dreams in the heavens. Yeah, I see you nodding your heads. You, you, you got one that stays here and one that stays here. That's why God put you together. <laughs> so the one that's up here can have this one here say, you know, don't, don't be foolish, but let's, let's have faith. And the one that's down, that's down here can have this one say, come on up, let's, let's have some peace in our lives. So number one, what is your peace quotient? How much peace are you living with? Number two, I'm gonna ask you today, to find somebody this week to share your current storm with or a storm that you've recently gone through. Why is that important? Because other people need to hear your story. I was talking with another person. I talked to a lot of people. I listened to a lot of people as well. I was listening to somebody the other day and they were describing for me the struggles that they have in their marriage. It's somebody that attends our church. You say, what? Somebody here has struggles in their marriage? I know that was your first question. You're like, what? And you're thinking, who could it be? And you went down the list. No, not Doug and Chris. They don't have no Booter and Debbie. They don't have no Grace and Nick. They don't have any. Harry and Crystal, they don't have any. Oh, Philip and Kathy, of course, they don't have any. And Webb and Carol, well, they might, but, but they don't, you know. And, and so you went down the list. You started looking at the marriages. You're like, oh, who, what? People have struggles in their marriage? And I said to them, you need to share your struggles with people in this church. And they said, why? I said, because if you don't, people look at you and think you don't have any issues. That's why you need to share your story. Because why? Because we are not perfect people. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not perfect. Say it with that tone as well. <laughs> you're not perfect. You're not all that. Right? Now look at your neighbor and say, I'm not perfect. I have struggles. I have storms. I have situations that come into my life. And I need you to pray with me. That's part of why we're doing this seven weeks of prayer. Because you need other people to pray with you in the storms of your life. So number two on this week's homework is share a current storm or a recent storm you had with someone. Something that you went through. Because I believe this. Many times when we finally step out of our perfectness and into our reality and we say to someone else, you know what, we're struggling in our marriage or we're struggling with our kids or we're struggling with our finances or we're struggling with this and we look at somebody, many times God will take us to the very people who have the same struggles or even better, they've been through the same struggles and they can promise you God is with you in the storm. Here's how he was with us in the storm. So number two, share one of your storms with somebody else. Number three, Offer peace to someone this week. Offer peace. Pray for peace. Remembering all that peace is. 
I want you to go back through that list of things that peace is. And I want you to find someone that looks like they're not experiencing prosperity or success or, or uh, a salvation or deliverance or any of those things. And you, I want you to be a person who says, can I pray for you? One of the things when Brandon came to me, he said, can we do this cookie challenge? And I said, absolutely, let's do a cookie challenge. Does that mean like an eating contest? That was what I was thinking he was going to say for a cookie challenge. But he's like, no, it's about giving cookies to other people. But when you do that, would you say, can we pray for you? And can you ask them, what if you would ask, is there a storm you're going through right now? Is there a difficult thing you're going through? We'd like to pray for that thing and offer peace to somebody. Because you and I, as followers of Jesus, carry with us the Prince of Peace. And your prayers can bring peace into somebody else's life. Bring peace to someone around you this week. That's my homework. Next week, I want to hear your testimonies of how you shared peace, of how you, how you opened up, of how God sent somebody to you that you needed in your life to share with you the peace that you can have. Let's stand.